Hello, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us this evening. Um, my name is Jessica Landau. I am an assistant instructional professor in the Committee on Environment, Geography, Urbanization, or SIGU. But before we get started with tonight's events, and I encourage you, if you haven't yet, grab a cookie before, because what I'm saying is much less important than what will happen in a few moments. Um, I have some other housekeeping notes to give you. First, the restrooms are located just over here by the entrance of the museum past the lockers. Um, and food and drink is to remain in the lobby only, please not in the galleries. But photographs are welcome. Also, you might notice flyers on a lot of the chairs. You can submit questions throughout the panel using the Poll Everywhere link that's on that flyer or on the QR code that's on there. Um, so please contribute throughout the panel. Um, and after, after the discussion, all of you are welcome and in fact encouraged to visit the Duckworth exhibition which will be open until about 8.15 p.m. The museum will close promptly at 8.20, however. And um, if you don't have time tonight to see it, there is still time to come back. Ruth Duckworth, Life as a Unity, will be on view through Sunday, February 4th, so there is still some time to come see the show. This event is co-presented by SIGU and the Smart Museum of Arts Feitler Center for Academic Inquiry. So if you don't know us, SIGU is an interdisciplinary platform for critical thinking, advanced research and innovative pedagogy on the societal and spatial dimensions of climate change, biodiversity loss, and other kinds of environmental transformation. Organized around the pillars of decarbonization, biodiversity protection, and environmental justice, SIGU seeks to investigate and respond to the environmental challenges of our time, not only by, advi by advancing climate change awareness, but by actively centering contemporary planetary environmental emergencies in all aspects of social research and humanistic inquiry. And so this event tonight, I think, is really illustrative of these goals, particularly our program's engagement with the environmental humanities and art. Our conversation tonight will, in some ways, go beyond just seeing art, like the works by Duckworth and the, those discussed by our presenters, as simply representations or representative of issues like climate change, but rather as unique modes of knowledge production about climate and climate change themselves. And the Feitler Center, our other um, co-sponsor, their mission is to advance connections across the University of Chicago's fields and disciplines, through which all students and faculty can powerfully experience and study works of art. The center fosters interdisciplinary scholarship, highlights the many ways that art can animate that scholarship, and supports the university's core commitment to free and open discussion. And so both SIGU and the SMART have full event calendars, including things like film screenings, lectures, artist talks, guided student hikes, and um, including SIGU's annual student symposium, some of them coming up very soon, like in two days. So I encourage you all to check out our websites for more details about these events. And before passing things off to Alexander, um, who's the Associate Director and Senior Research Associate in Global Political Ecology in the Urban Theory Lab, um, I want to send out um, a huge thank you to him and Anissa from the Feitler Center for organizing this event, as well as to Sabina for contributing to, to thoughts about this programming, and to her and Frederick, who's our interim director at SIGU, for, for steering the program this year, um, as well as our colleagues at the SMART, Barrett Ness, CJ Lind, Benya Malloy, Meg Jackson Fox, and Laura Stewart for co um, collaborating with SIGU around this project, and also to Laura um, for just curating such a generative exhibition, as well as Huge thank you to Carlo Diaz, Danielle Smith, and Tess Conway for all of their coordination to make this event and pretty much everything to do with SIGU run smoothly. Um, and with that, I will pass it off. Thank you. Okay, let me see if I can do this without dropping anything and ruining the event before it starts. Um, so I feel like uh, the first thing that I want to say is thank you for making it here uh, amidst the fog. I'm not sure if it's a sort of blessing from Duckworth, you know, descending in climatic form upon us, um, or something a little bit more um, foreboding, I'll let you decide, maybe a little bit of both. Um, but I, I wanted to just start by saying that I'm, I'm so thrilled that we at Seagull are finally getting to do a collaborative event with the folks at the Feitler Center and, and SMART. It's what we hope is the first of, of many collaborations that really start to push thinking around the environmental humanities and art practice um, in concert with what we're trying to do uh, in SIGU. And there's a lot more to do there. So we really hope that those of you who are in this room now will continue to be a part of that conversation because it's not, it's not every day that you get to sort of reboot a program at UChicago. 
And there's an openness to this moment that is pretty extraordinary. And it's an openness that I think demands and requires our part participation in shaping what it means to think about climate change, biodiversity loss, environmental transformation in this moment, and not just from a sort of doom and gloom perspective, but a space of practice, right? What does that look like? Well, we all get to answer that a little bit today. And fortunately, our, our illustrious guests will, will help uh, provoke some of uh, those thoughts as well. So let me offer a couple sort of framing thoughts uh, that expand on, on the, the notes from the summary description. So we are, as the Anthropocene proposition goes, all geologic agents now. But somewhat counterintuitively, for many, if not most, this conjures association not with the deep time of geolo geologic epochs, but the relentless and really relentless nowness of anthropogenic climate change. I mean, these things are, of course, related, right? But not always in a straightforward way. So how do we get back and forth between the geologic and the climatic? Put otherwise, how does the geologic become a medium for indexing climatic transformation? And how, in turn, does climate become a kind of ubiquitous medium of earthly transformation? Now, the answers that we get from Duckworth are a little bit different than the Anthropocene Working Group, for example, that's finding evidence in the stratigraphic record. So it's really nice to be able to think with this work right, about this relationship between the geologic and climatic, instead of starting with the, the, sort of the proposal for the golden spike, assigning the Anthropocene to a particular date and place via its location in the stratigraphic record. And we really find ourselves, I think, even in that conversation, once again, between Earth and sky, rehearsing the oldest cosmological scripts, debating agency, nature, techniques, that are really as old as our stories about origins and end times. So let me just use that slippage, if you will, between the geologic and the climatic. It's not the first ceramics-related pun I'm going to make. I'm really sorry. It's just going to happen, and I can't stop myself. Uh, but to use that slippage as something as an opening to frame tonight's event in light of Ruth Duckworth's simultaneously earthy and airy body of work. And we're really fortunate, I think, to be able to turn to that work and the many bodies and kinds of embodiments it presents to us as a guide in taking up these themes. Or perhaps another way of thinking about it is that each piece in the exhibition is itself a potential guide, a sort of avatar of how earthly bodies turn towards climate or might become climatic. And when we speak of bodies becoming climatic, we're necessarily invoking all kinds of different transformations, right? Of scalar relations, that telescope between a flash of lightning from the newest superstorm, to the long-welded arc of fossil energy combustion and nuclear fission, of individual experience, situated sensing, and collective cognition distributed as much between skin as satellites, of the mass phase change, reordering and intermingling of material systems that enlist our witness and mourning to the great airborne funeral marches of forests become transcontinental smoke plumes. Now, there's much to say about each of these points. And I'm glad I don't have to say more because we have some people who will come at those questions obliquely through their own work. So before I turn things over to them, let me just signal a few further questions to, if you will, sort of bounce between Duckworth's sculptures and the work that Sadia, Alberto, and, and Joshi will share with us shortly. As we grapple with the increasing dissonance between everyday life and epical climate and environmental change, I don't know why I just said epical. That's a weird way of saying it, epical, thank you. Uh, how, how might we hold these intimate and remote forms of sensing in a, in a more generative tension? How might we learn from the space between what we can touch smell and see, or hear, and what we can observe or study from afar? And are they so different? How might aesthetic practice offer insight and inspiration for ways of knowing climate and its many forms of change? And finally, coming back to this theme of transformation, how might we consider these embodiments of climate as media not only for transformation, a changing of shape, but something more radical perhaps, a transmutation, a collective reworking, reshaping, or remolding of our mutable natures, like so much proverbial clay. Sorry, I did it again. So, to think through these questions and to hopefully provoke a number of new ones, we're delighted to welcome our presenters this evening. And the way this, this will run 
is that I will each introduce each of them in turn, they will present, um, and then we'll have a sort of discussion and Q&A session afterwards. So again, um, Jessica mentioned this, but you'll see a little QR code um, on these, these printouts. If you prefer to submit a question that way, great. If you want to sort of just use it as something to take notes during the, the presentation so you don't forget the great question that you had, fantastic. Um, if, on the other hand, you just like using your voice and you want to use a mic, we'll have that too. Okay? But we just really want this to be an engaged discussion um, after the, the works are presented so that I have to say as little as possible, given that I might lose my voice by the end of this. Okay, so first we will hear from Sadia Mirza, followed by Alberto Ortega Trejo, and finally Joshi Radin Flores. And so let me introduce uh, Sadia first. Sadia works with time based media. Uh, her interests and in research range broadly from landscape studies, cartography, science and technology, and sound image mapping. Her current and past research projects focus on methods using filmmaking, animation, virtual reality, and cartography. She's an architect by training and has spent the last eight years teaching a range of subjects, including architecture design, media arts, ethnography, and visual and spatial analysis. She works in collaboration with scientists and researchers as well, using new media to unblack box data sets that tell stories about war, conflict, and climate change. Her work pays close attention to the sensory impressions of data, sound, image, and texture, experienced in immersion with a narrative that shows how knowledge is created in a world of incomplete information. Her most recent project, conducted in conversation with archaeologists, focuses on visualizing conflict and militarization in Kandahar, Afghanistan. And she's currently in conversation with glaciologists and is working on a project on the sounds of historic Antarctic ice events and is working on a film based on field work on the Rhone Glacier and the Swiss Alps, which I believe you'll be presenting on today. Something, sort of. OK, great. And she is, amidst everything else, wrapping up her PhD here, an artist in residence at uh, Cité Internationale de, des Arts. I am not a French speaker, as you can tell, um, in Paris, and is faculty and visiting, uh, faculty and a visiting researcher at uh, Sciences Po in Paris as well. Okay, Sadia. Thank you very much, Alexander. That was uh, a riveting uh, discussion. And I'm delighted to be here today. Um, Duckworth's work is really very heartfelt. Um, walking through the experience at the museum really felt very visceral. So I'm excited to speak about this work. Inhabiting Duckworth's work is like scaling geomorphology itself. Walking through a series of Duckworth's environments, I am struck by the entanglement of both social history as well as the scientific imaginations of the terra firma. The use of artistic expression is more than an option here. It is imperative for immersion into the fluid, dynamic, and quickly morphing nature of the earth, water, and sky. Hydrological systems, for example, are unresolved natural processes that are hard to quantify, for they are in an ongoing choreography of transformations from one state to another. In her essay on clouds, Lorini Dastin writes that it is very difficult to develop a stable system of representation of natural processes that entail infinite variability. That is to say, where everything is turning into everything else all at the same time. We touch, feel, smell, and see clouds in the sky, but it is only a fraction of time before they turn into something else. Walking into the Heinz laboratory is like thinking with the hydrological cycle itself. Earth, water, and sky blend across the walls, not restricted by the architecture of geometric planes, but emerging of forms that express a spatial continuum rather than a collection of objects. These are environments, and they invite an inhabitation of the forces that change from one state to another. Leaving indexical prints of their existence upon human perception, craters, vapors, hills, and lakes. 
Some of the textural grains of Duckworth's works evoke traces of sand, gravel, and fragments that look like cracked earth, the traces left behind by tornadoes, and clouds that look like mushrooms growing out of fungal spores. Others look like the sharp ridges that evoke the faces of mountain ranges, sometimes looking like the fins of fish. Duckworth's work is scalar and signifies the generally distinct notions of what is solid and fluid, evoking the spectrum of what lies in between these traditionally distinct states of matter. It echoes the notion of solid fluidity, if you will, that solids can move like fluid, that the process of fracturing and compression in dense material forms like clay and ice are in fact viscous, much like lava or magma. Her works express this materially through the properties of clay as well as through the gradations of color, texture, and form. This echoes the field of rheology, the physics of how materials flow under applied force. Indeed, this is how mountains, tectonic plates, ice sheets, and glaciers move. To express the flow of matter of not just liquids, but most importantly of solids as well, this merging of solid and fluid materialities is also an allegorical expression for similarly collapsing the traditional occidental distinction between hard and soft knowledges, between the arts and the sciences, in ways that also collapse other dichotomies such as interiority and exteriority material and spirituality, homogeneity and heterogeneity, as well as matter and meaning, all of which have been partially mapped in Western thinking onto a traditional separation between earth and sky. Drawn along the surface of the ground, as anthropologist Christian Semoniti also argues in his work on the concept of becoming viscous. More broadly, expressing the in-betweenness of matter and meaning also alludes to the concept of unity in Duckworth's work, the expression of the environment, both materially and phenomenologically as a continuum uh, in materials and mediums such as air, ground, water, rock, soil, ice, vapors, and the atmosphere can be seen as liminal <laughs> thresholds between one state of matter and another. And what are these unities, if not expressions of our very own bodies? The space in which the environment makes its home through both imaginations, territories, tissues, and ligaments, bones, and skeletal structures. Duckworth's work uses the body as a metaphor for the same unity that can be seen in the lakes, clouds, and sky in her works. To sense the water, the sky, and the earth is also a process of inhabiting our own bodies, the stratosphere that permeates, the layers of our skin, mountain ridges that resonate in our ribs, rivers flowing in our veins, and the delicate vibrations of the earth circulating through our tissues, bones, and membranes. Most of all, the human sensorium, stereoscopic vision, and binaural sound, the perception of temperature, heat, and humidity are all, are all part and parcel of the idea that we are not spectators, we are the environment. And so over the next few minutes, I will present a narrative reading and sound experience called A Phenomenology of Iceberg Collisions, a work named after a paper written by Professor Douglas Mikhail at the Geophysical Sciences at the University of Chicago, a cherished interlocutor who introduced me to the world of how glacial ice sings. The work uses seismic data captured of the largest ever recorded iceberg called the B15 in 2000, and this data set is a historical record of 18 months of data compressed into a few minutes of sound. It is therefore more than human sound, something that goes beyond the human-centric concept of the Anthropocene and enters into the tentacular space of Haraway's provocation that to be human is to have um, multi-species agency. Next, we'll be presenting Alberto Ortega Trejo, uh, who's a Mexican architect and artist. His work uses drawing, sculpture, writing, and video to explore representations of indigeneity and architectural modernity, and the production of extreme environments in the Americas. 
He has been an Ideas Fellow of the Society of Architectural Historians and a grantee of the Humex. Humex. It is here. Okay. Humex Foundation for Contemporary Art, Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, and D. Case, among others. His work has been shown in venues like the DePaul Art Museum, Bienal Sur, Caf Foscari Zatere, Harun Faroki Institute, and many others. He was the curator of The Last of the Animal Builders at the Edith, Edith Farnsworth House and the spatial designer for Proof of Personhood, Identity and Authenticity in the Face of AI at the Singapore Art Museum. He's been a guest speaker for institutions and organizations like MoMA's Emilio, Emilio Ambas Institute, the American Institute of Architects, the Society of Architectural Historians, Smart Museum of Art, hooray, uh, Materia Abierta, UPenn, Mass Context, and Centro. He currently teaches architecture history at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago and manages the Katz Center for Mexican Studies at our very own University of Chicago. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, I will share a text that is kind of at the center of a couple of projects that I've developed uh, in the past year. Um, it doesn't like directly address the topic, but the questions are there. You know, like you know, it's it's a journey. So bear with me and go along. Okay, so between 1948 and 1954. Acclaimed architectural critic and historian, Sibyl Moholy Nash, with the support of the Architectural League of New York, traveled to indigenous territories and colonial settlements in the United States, Mexico, and the Caribbean, where she documented vernacular uh, architectures with the purpose of bringing attention to the spatial production of anonymous builders uh, in the American continent. She produced a book titled Native Genius in Anonymous Architecture as the result of her observations and classifications of these kinds of architectures. Published 10 years before uh, Rudovsky's famous contribution, Architecture Without, Without Architects, Moholy, Nash, uh, Moholy Nash's work is a singular phenomenon in the history of modern architectural criticism and, and theoretical production. This project, in her words, was a response to the real estate boom facilitated by uh, the Bauhaus influence in the U.S. construction industry. And Sibyl Moholy came to the U.S. Uh, with the Bauhaus. Uh, she was a part, uh, like the partner of Laszlo Moholy Nash. Um, Native Genius in Anonymous Architecture focused its critique on the alienating distance between the human and the natural produced by industrial construction processes and expects to find an answer to the, de to the dehumanization uh, brought up by modern architecture in the ways in which territories with few economic and technological resources respond to the needs imposed by their environment. We could easily dismiss these kinds of observations today as, this, as they fall under reductive pretenses, but ho however, a more detailed analysis uh, of the context in which this book was produced and the reflections that this trip uh, unleashed later on in the work of uh, Sibyl Moholy demand deeper attention to this catalog of anonymous constructions, uh, the observations written by its author and their tangential histories. Uh, Let's start by looking at this photograph taken by Sibyl uh, during her trips to Mexico in 1953. Uh, an Otomi stone, uh, stone house in the Mesquital Valley region in the state of Hidalgo, which is actually my hometown, uh, and basically the reason why I got obsessed with these particular journeys, uh, this particular set of journeys. Uh, this Otomi stone house was used by Moholy Nash as an example to illustrate the form and function section of her uh, book, Native Genius in Anonymous Architecture. In the foreground, outside the house, three Otomi children and a dog are portrayed staring at Seville's camera. The Mesquital Valley is key to understand the process of modernization of Mexico City. It is a site of mineral extraction, cement and marble production, oil refinement, the place where Mexico City's sewage waters are dumped, 
uh, where vegetables are harvested and with a population that to this day is constantly migrating to Mexico City and to the United States. In an article published by Perspecta, uh, the Yale University's architecture journal in 1955, uh, titled, Sibyl uh, wrote uh, this essay titled uh, Environment in Anonymous Architecture, two years before the final publication of the, of the book. So this was like a preparation uh, for one of the chapters of, of the book. Uh, in, in this, in this essay, we can see like ideas being laid out for what later on would become native genius in anonymous architecture. This Ottomi stone house is illustrated in uh, is illustrated in uh, in the essay at Perspecta, uh, and is used to illustrate her points uh, on the mastery of anonymous builders in dealing with climatic forces through their buildings. Rainwater capture, natural ventilation, domes, strategic openings on the facade for thermal regulation, efficient material selection, etc. But in the Perspecta phot photograph, the children are missing and the dog is looking away. So, such peculiar difference reads as a profoundly, uh, you know, fundamental decision for her on how this kind of architecture should be portrayed. Uh, it must include the subject that inhabits, uh, that inhabits the architecture to produce a solid image of environmental coherence. By including the Otomi children in the book, uh, in the final word, Moholy Nash folds them together with the structure and portrays them as extensions of the building's environmental functions. The indigenous children organized by height with the one in the middle blending with the stacking pattern of the stones are rendered as tectonic elements. A form of representation that brings the body of the subject as another resource of nature and a fundamental element of the structure. Architecture, subject, and environment become an immanent totality to the eyes uh, of the surveyor of anonymous architecture. Such, such reading on the tectonic representation of an indigenous subject is reinforced in the same chapter of Native Genius in Anonymous Architecture, where Moholy Nash uses photographs taken by American photographer Laura Gilpin uh, of Pueblo women and children in New Mexico. Pictured as adobe caryatids, the women in the images seem to extend the building's structure into their bodies and into the, the utilitarian objects that they hold in their heads and hands into a semi-continuous surface. The same manner of inserting the body of indigenous peoples into an architectural structure as a kind of ornamental layer had been done five decades, five decades er, earlier by the Mexican state. In 1906, during the inauguration of Mexico City's Gran Canal del Desagüe, the, the first uh, massive uh, or like monumental attempt to drain Mexico City, uh, dressed in traditional Otomi can canvas garments, weaving flags of Mexico, and standing atop the, parated, the parapets of the last sewage maintenance station, the workers as used of, as living gargo gargoyles of the edifice of Mexican modernity. Their bodies are turned into another decorative layer of this hybrid space, a space articulated as a forum where Porfirio Diaz and his cabinet paraded with international investors from Siemens, Ericsson, companies that to this day, you know, like exist and operate all over the world. Um, and around a pool, uh, they paraded around the pool of sewage waters coming from Mexico City, the same black waters polluting the territory of the workers adorning the structure. Uh, to this day, the Mezquital Valley is, uh, has been designated by Mexico's environmental agency as an environmental hell. Uh, we have the highest cancer rates uh, and everything that you can imagine. Um, okay, so in a speech, Sorry, but da -da -da. in a speech, Sibyl Moholy Nash wrote to address the Architectural League of New York in, accept in acceptance for her grant, she makes, an, she makes an outstanding remark. But it is also a great challenge, a challenge to prove to myself whether the lesson I learned from being an immigrant is valid. 
This lesson is that there can be only one way of surviving the shock of abandoning one's native country. This, this lesson is to look for the combinator of human, uh, in human existence, to find out what it is in the efforts and, work, and works of men that supersedes race and nationality. The place to look, for me, it is the effort of building. In such universalist approach, her effort of making sense of her own displacement, seeks insights and legacies of migration, adaptation, and in the resilience of others, a way to recognize herself, uh, again, as a human, through all of this process of displacement. In the closing remarks of her speech, she also states that this trip is a response to the canons established by the figure of the male genius, a specter embodied by the ghosts of her now deceased father, Martin Pitch, a German architect, and her husband, the famed Bauhaus professor and painter, uh, Laszlo Moholinash, who are also mentioned in the speech with a somewhat sarcastic tone. Uh, in an entry of her diary, Three years after her travel to the Americas, Seville recalls one night during her trip. She describes a dark storm and the thick hot winds of Tecolutla in the south of Mexico. She describes her struggle to breathe as her lungs refused to suck in the leaden atmosphere, word that she crossed out and substituted with more moisture. Emphasizing her alienness to the environment by, by recalling a bodily rejection to an unfamiliar atmosphere, her experience resonates with Henry Wooten's description of the labor of the architect. Quoted by Seville in the introduction of Native Genius in Anonymous Architecture, Wooten states that the architect should be not a superficial and floating artificer, but a diver into the causes and mysteries of proportion. The diver, if we are uh, to follow the metaphor, inserts itself into an atmosphere hostile to its own body, but it does so to find something yet to be known, and in doing so, it must invent ways to improve its own mechanisms of mediation and adaptation to such inhospitable environments. And we wonder, did Sibyl perform any form of self-adaptation during these trips? In a complicated way, she did. In the same diary entry, uh, describing the, 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 the hot and thick storm of Tecolutla, she writes, somewhere in the, in the dark across the beach stood my Jeep, which I had learned to drive like a man. And back in the same darkness stood the Mexican man who was my guide. Him too, I had learned to handle like a tool. In the same recollection, she dreads the misery and challenging conditions of the women she encountered during her trip. Seville didn't speak Spanish. Her experience of this unfamiliar environment was mediated by that Mexican man standing in the dark. The anonymous in Native Genius in Anonymous Architecture is not a given, but rather the methodology by which Seville was able to exercise a sort of masculine power of the, over those who saw as the instruments to make sense of her own experience of alienation as an immigrant in the US and as a woman in the field of architectural history. Uh, Sorry, the Mexican man in the dark embodies not only an imminent relationship between body and environment, but rather the limits of modernity to reframe itself when encountering anything defying capture or needing a critical engagement with cosmological difference. The dar that darkness is precisely the site where Seville's gaze stopped and was unable to find a mechanism of adaptation beyond the comparative, the comparative localism that she was performing. Uh, the metaphor of the diver used by Henry Wotton and by Seville, uh, is that my timer? No, ah, oh, okay, <laughs> sorry. Uh, the metaphor of the diver used by Henry Wotton and Sibyl Moholy uh, is one that embodies not only the Promethean impulse to transform and record the world into a readable image for the human through technology, but also allows us to reflect on the making of environments as intellectual and narrative frameworks. After the Porfirian Gran Canal del Desagüe failed to keep up with the expansion and excretion produced by Mexico City, and due to constant flooding, the administration of the city deemed necessary to dig deeper and longer to dump the city's waste more efficiently in the water bodies of the Mesquital Valley. 
1954, the works for a new deep sewage system started, and in 1975, after its completion, Mexico City's government released a documentary that revised and celebrated the making of this new marvel of engineering. El drenaje profundo de la Ciudad de México. Uh, you know, the deep sewage of Mexico City. The documentary narrated uh, from a really like technological utopian perspective the intellectual prowess of this enterprise and, and portrayed not only the like strong belief in technology to improve human environments, but also the, uh, its capacity to produce the bodies necessary to sustain and achieve new efficient uh, metropolis and a dry metropolis. As the excavation for the drenaje profundo and the deep sewage traverse different kinds of soil, from rock to moth, a site-specific building technique that ensured the safety of the tunnel construction process uh, had to be implemented. Based on a technique uh, for tunnel building patented by Thomas Cochrane, the British mercenary and radical politician, the engineers of the deep sewage system maintained the structural integrity of the excavations by injecting compressed air into the tunnel with a pressure chamber. The, precious air, the pressurized air injected in the excavation area would create a high pressure, pressure oxygen bubble that acted as a temporary gas, gaseous structure that diminished the risk, the risk of collapse within the tunnel excavations by blocking the capillarity of the soil. However, to perform any kind of labor within this gaseous uh, structure, which, uh, you know, it's like a high pressure environment, the bodies of the workers had to be mechanically adjusted to the new atmosphere produced by this uh, pressure, pressurized chamber. So they would sit inside the pressure plug uh, and the workers would be slowly adapted to this alien environment to perform their labors within the excavation area by injecting air into the chamber and until they would slowly accustom to this, uh, you know, to find the right balance between body and excavation zone. In the documentary, after showing documentation of the workers patiently waiting uh, for their bodies to become accustomed to, to the working area, the image cuts and shows a sequence of a diver exploring the crevices of a dark underwater environment using a lantern. The diving sequence cuts and we are back witnessing the newly adapted laborers efficiently performing their tasks. In the introductory chapter of Native Genius in Anonymous Architecture, Sibyl Moholy would insist via etymology that environment is only produced in circumambulation. Therefore, she invites us to meander in an image of the world where environments do not exist as such, but rather there is only organisms within organisms ad infinitum in a continuous process of material exchange. An environment, therefore, is only born in separation, in delimitation, and is unable to exist as a concept without territoriality and politically traced boundaries. Subject, structure, and environment, again, are portrayed as a logical and coherent whole, but not as a primitive correspondence with nature, rather thought of as a necessary technological function to enable the efficient development of the modern city. Another instant, instance in this oddly intertwined history where the folding of the worker's body with a tectonic and instrumental logic is taken to a grandiose scale is the one produced to honor the workers that died in the making of the deep sewage. In 1975, Mexico City's government inaugurated the monument to the deep sewage worker, circled by the Museum of the Deep Sewage. Designed by Mexican sculptress Angela Gurria, the memorial, composed by five monumental concrete plinths and four metal sections of the actual tunnel structure, stand in its author's own accord to represent the arms and hands of the dead workers emerging from the depths of darkness into the light. The arms and hands of the workers are abstractly severed and portrayed in its ultimate mechanical function. The worker is not understood as a whole, but rather as a necessary fragment of the larger technical body it belongs to. Through the spectral amputation of the worker's arms, we are reminded as the marginal body is a tectonic body, its value resides only in its, in its fragmentation and its mechanical assemblage. The museum only operated for two years, and today its structure is used as a CETIS, a public trade school that trains auto repair technicians, electricians, carpenters, steel workers. Uh, the monument of the deep, uh, of the deep sewage wor uh, worker still, tan still stands in the city's schoolyard 
as a tacit reminder of the conditions of the working class in contemporary Mexico. One of the main ideas that traversed the work of, of Civil Moholy from Native Genius to Matrix of Men, and that she aimed to develop further in her unpublished manuscript, Pragma, was the relationship between animality and architecture. In Native Genius, uh, in Anonymous Architecture, sorry, Civil compared native buildings to nests and burrows, and conflating poverty with animality, she developed a primitivist, re primitivist reading of a political economy that she didn't fully understand. Again, we are in the Mesquital Valley, a site of brutal mineral extraction and dispossession since colonial times. Uh, you know, part of the reason why the sewage was like so popular with the government, it was because it was supposed to bring irrigation because it's like a deserted area. But the actual reason why that place is a desert, it's because during the colonial encounter, sheep were introduced and sheep like ate everything. You know, uh, there's a really good book called A Plague of Sheep that explains all of that. Um, so, but in doing, in doing this conflation between poverty and, anim and animality, the idea that the architecture is the site where life must be nurtured and reproduced as dictated by nature, led her to compare the mechanics of animal building with the, structure of, the structural logic of modern architecture. In a chapter titled Defenseless Breeders uh, of her unpublished manuscript, Pragma, uh, sorry, Sibyl writes, in animal structure, structure and space are one. Structure is not the means to span a functional void, but structure is the functional void. Beehive, nest, spider web, etc. A secondary factor, there are no alternatives, which makes Ms. Bandero and Skidmore, Owens and Merrill the last of animal builders. The critical question of this declaration resides, I believe, not in the attempt to naturalize modernity as the logical consequence of evolution, but rather, rather that the only way to become human relies on our capacity to create devices of chimerization, devices to allow our defenseless bodies not only to adapt and survive, but to transform, to be able to experience and make a world where all potential human and non-human intelligences are able to thrive. Recall, recalling the origin uh, of this logic, Sibyl compels us to think that the task and capacities of the diver shouldn't be only the duty of the architect, but the responsibility of any subject facing overwhelming atmospheres and uncertainty. To dive into the darkness of history, recalibrate our senses, and expand the, ra the range of what architectural perception can do for human becoming. To investigate history not as a repository of explications or confirmations on the roots of our discontents, but as a method to craft an ethics and politics of self-adaptation, hybridization, and unpredictability. And if Ms. Van der Rohe and SOM were the last of animal builders, what was to come next? In the final note of her travel journal, two words are underlined, tradition and transformation. Later, she would declare that tradition can only become tyrannical, but the legacy of indigenous building endured in her mind by the capacity of the anonymous builder, of the human standing in the dark, of transforming hostility into possibility. And thank you. That is my contribution. Thank you, Alberto, that's brilliant. Okay, so before we turn to an open discussion, I'm very pleased to welcome Joshi Braden Flores, who is an interdisciplinary art artist and educator based here in Chicago. She is a member and served three years as the program director for the Pilsen Environmental Rights and Reform Organization's grassroots education campaign for Illinois' Just Energy Transition programs. Illinois Solar for All. In 2020, she co-created Chemical Reactions and environment, on Environmental Struggles in Chicago with Alberto, a platform for artistic response to questions of ecology, equity, and industry in partnerships with grassroots environmental justice organizations. She was a recipient, recipient of a 2021 fellowship from the Goethe Institute here in Chicago, a 2020 residency at the Chicago Artists Coalition, a 2019 fellowship at the Vermont Studio Center, 
and the 2017 Dangler Curatorial Fellow in the Department of Photography at the Art Institute of Chicago. Her texts have appeared in Moontreff uh, Curatorial Studies magazine, the Brill Critical Plant Studies series, and Posthumanism and Art and Science, a reader from Columbia University Press. She curated a 2022 exhibition for Ralph Arnold Gallery, This Too Shall Pass, addressing material entanglements and shared futures. She's exhibited work in galleries and project spaces in the US and internationally, and she completed an MFA and MA degrees as a Merit Scholar and Writing Fellow at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago and currently lectures in the photography department of the, at the School of the Art Institute in Chicago. You're still with us. And doing way it. to go. Gonna go um, get some hot water and leave you too. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Sigu and Alexander, for inviting me. Thank you to my co panelists. Thank you to everybody for staying awake. And um, let's go, let's take it home. Um, I don't think this is doing anything. Is it? It is. Okay, I won't move <laughs> it. All right, so um, I'm going to talk about a few projects of mine, some print-based projects um, that I see as being in conversation with parts of Ruth's practice and that I think address the themes of scalar difficulties and um, sort of some of the promises or difficulties and then also how I'm dealing with those through objects and practices. First, though, I am going to share some images of this utopian off the grid back to the land commune where I'm from, because that experience and the aftermath of that experience is really at the back of a lot of my questions and my work. Um, I think it's interesting to consider whether Ruth might have been curious about these things too, considering she was working at the same time that a lot of these experiments were going on. Often I have questioned from what perspective or vantage point did uh, a lot of the choices that these people were making, how did that make any sense to them? Um, but these are some kind of prefatory images. And I'll just leave them there. So, this is Earthrise appearing in the New York Times in 1968. And I know this image and the Apollo images generally have been chewed on and picked over and digested a lot, but I wanted to claim my own turn with them. I was interested in these images for several reasons. One was a curiosity aligned with Buckminster Fuller's hope that seeing this, the Earth from space would transform humanity's relationship to Spaceship Earth and we would have this ethical reorientation. This hope seemed reinforced by the overview effect, which is this shift in awareness that are, is reported by astronauts who do go to space and then uh, report a profound new appreciation for Earth, for the inhabitants there, for the fragility of our planet and this thin life-giving atmosphere. I really like this one Apollo astronaut, James Lovell, who reported that, quote, Earthrise gives the person a complete understanding and glimpse of her position in the universe by looking back at the being she calls home. His experience leads him to identify Earth not as an it, but as a being, a crucial shift in linguistic representation from an object to a subject. We know how problematic and complex these images are as well, scaffolded on imperializing militarized projects and imposing a universal discourse about one world humanity. For geographer Dennis Cosgrove, the Apollo images function in two ideological ways, in the discourse of one world or human universality and in whole earth or ecological fragility. Both of these discourses rest on cultural and historical assumptions, and both exemplify the urge to establish a transcendental, univocal, and universally valid vantage point from which to sketch this totalizing discourse. They deny 
histories of geopolitical difference and aggression and advance Western ideas of expansionism and territoriality. But I didn't let this stop me. <laughs> For me, they still summoned this question of how to locate oneself ethically in a global imaginary and what that positioning might look like and how it might be practiced. As a personal aside, when I see these pictures of blue marble on flags, I wonder why we discriminate against the rest of the solar system. For one open studio evening, I projected Earthrise into a corner of my studio, distorting it and giving it a new spatial orientation. I had covered the walls with clay slip beforehand and also my body and I was sitting there reading my mother's dreams by candlelight from a journal that she had kept while she lived on this commune. I took this photo and I turned it into a screen print. For an exhibition, I printed distorted earthrise and mixed in some engine oil and some of my blood into the ink to really seal the deal. Our marriage, my complicity, our symbolic unity, or perhaps our dysfunctional relationship and my domestic violence. This led me to create a longer screen print series, Bent, which were my re-mediated, distorted versions of, the, of some of the Apollo images. I projected the images in my studio, onto my body, disrupting them with planes, and then re-photographing them, bitmapping them, turning them again into a flattened plane, and showing them on the vertical. Having a background in photography, but feeling pretty unconvinced about the wisdom of making new images, I was also interested in a more bodily approach to image making. Making these prints takes physical work. They're pretty large for screen prints. Um, there's a lot of effort involved to get those blacks. And there's no camera in between myself and the object. Breaking down the image was my way of killing off the romance in maybe a Benjaminian hat tip reprocessing, recirculating, letting them fall apart. After this series, I shifted and decided to come back to Earth and the body. These are a series of monotype prints called Records and Fragments. They're made on a press and I sourced secondhand baby clothing and found packaging materials like those you might get from an Amazon package. I came to the body in, a, in the fresh new body scale of the infant. This felt like another way to approach shared commonality between earthlings and also maybe not an unfamiliar strategy who hasn't manipulated images of children to call upon our shared something or other. We've all been infants, hopefully, and have shared this vulnerability at some point. This is also the scale of the indexical mark. This is a direct one-to-one -one relationship. We talk about indexicality a lot in photography, so that seemed important. Mm -hmm. For me, considering the young lives that inhabited these, clothing, this, these clothes spoke to concerns in a more temporal register. What does the present owe to the future? These suggest ghosts to me or artifacts of children who maybe once were or never will be. What of the intergenerational violence perpetrated by those who burn the present at the expense of their children. 
How do we care now or love differently when care and love have so often been associated in Western consumerist cultures with providing material goods, resources that oppose conditions for future well-being? The packaging materials were also intended to protect and care for a thing. How do we protect and care for stuff and ourselves? These are units and packages from when, for whom. The prints are also really small and the way I hung them was like they were little specimens that forced you to come close and examine them. They're also so saturated with ink, it's like having a little miniature oil spill on the page. For me, this series also touched on the deeply personal choice about whether or not to bring more humans into the world. Whether to make kin or kids or both or neither. What bothered me at the end of, this, of making this series were the materials. If I wanted to be more consistent, I felt I needed to get my materials into better alignment. This isn't something that's ever perfect, but it's something that I think about. How are my materials congruent with the idea? It's a pretty basic artist thing. I decided to move to a process that tried to better express these concerns. Anthotype is an early photographic process that uses photosensitive plant materials to make images. It's fussy, but it's kind of the ultimate in low tech. You can think of your body getting, a, getting tan lines as a similar process. You're a photosensitive surface, but you can't be fixed. One quality of anthotypes is that they are born to die. They can't be made permanent and will fade pretty quickly once they're exposed to prolonged light. I think of them as performances because of this quality. This also makes them undesirable to most people. They can't be collected. Museums don't want them. What could be better? After a lot of testing, I ended up working with spinach. I blend it with alcohol, ethyl alcohol and then strain it finely multiple times. I apply multiple coats to papers to get as much density or tonal range as possible. They also require a high UV index, which in Chicago means you have a very limited window where you can actually make these. It's a summer project. I got permission from a friend to get access to a roof on an apartment building in Pilsen where it was really windy all the time and everything wanted to blow away. These are test strips. You use positives rather than negatives for this process. And while it would be easier to use acetate, I've been using doubled up oiled architectural bond paper, which has a tendency to separate and diminish the clarity. These are a couple of early tests. This is one of those archival, not, well, from my archive, the, an image from the commune. This paper didn't work well, and neither did the emulsion, which is made from wheatgrass. There's a lot of failure involved, and nothing will last. This is a test image of a ComEd bill, because this was also during the time when I was working for uh, Illinois' income qualified solar programs, trying to do my bit to decarbonize locally, contribute to a global process, and assist in efforts towards what one might hope would be uh, some kind of just energy transition.
The SolarScape performance series is something I've been working with for the past couple of summers. The images are appropriated from Google and NASA, and they're images of some of the largest solar developments in the world. This is from a Longyang Dam Solar Park uh, in China. I'm not going to go through all of them, but this, this print um, was in a show, and now it's retired because it's faded. I like this process of doubling a solar exposure of a solar inflected landscape. Again, taking a horizontal plane and turning it into a vertical object. The last one was in China and this one is in Egypt. And then more recently I've been looking at copper mines for the dialogue that they hold with producing solar panels. These are copper mines and they look different because um, different conditions, different emulsion, different sun, um, that's part of the characteristic. With a lifespan of 25 to 30 years, there's going to be a glut of used solar panels really soon and at least the plans in Illinois' program did not account for sort of what would complete that cycle, which seems absurd. Anyway, um, the need for these rare earth minerals is just going to continue to grow, and I think we're all aware of kind of the devastation that mining these has on the local communities. And um, I wanted to bring that relationship to the foreground. I'm still feeling my way through this work it's, I don't know if it's complete. I don't know if um, their disappearing is important. Um, I don't know if I'll resolve that before they all disappear either. If any of you have a rooftop that you'd like to loan me, <laughs> let's talk. Um, this is Tokipala, Peru. So I'm going to leave you leave us there for now. Thank you.